Right, okay, people, so we are in for another episode of the Legacy Podcast, a very special one at that too. We are in for episode 50 today. It feels like yesterday we were just starting out on our first couple of episodes, and now fast forward, we are on our episode 50. And to celebrate that, we have another guest on the podcast. Goes by the name of Kieran Colbert. So we have been following each other for quite a while now, supporting each other's journey. Both stand for similar values. So I'm going to get, hand you over to Kieran now. So if you just give us a bit of an insight into what you do, who you are, and as you have an update on how you're dealing with things. Yeah, man. So uh, I, I'm a PT and an online coach. Obviously, just an online coach at the moment yeah, yeah. With, the, with the current circumstances. I've managed to help out um, a significant amount of the one-to-one clients on an online basis now. Um, I am a bodybuilder. I'm well. I'm actually currently in the process of working towards my first uh, quote-unquote bodybuilding show. Um, before that, I was a men's physique athlete. Uh, I'd say I've been competing now for about five years um, in that time, just sort of going through the ranks as a men's physique athlete and now sort of looking to uh, transition into the to the bodybuilding side of things. Yeah. So obviously how was sort of like PT and then how have you handled that transition from going from the PT? Because um, I assume was you in like a similar position to me where it was more PT but slowly transitioning into full-time online coach. Is that the plan with you? Uh, I mean, to be honest with you, mate, I first started as a PT and there was no intention to, to do online. It, mm. it was only kind of created once the demand was there, if mm. you know what I mean. Once I kind of started getting the demand for the for the online side of things, I sort of developed into that. Um, obviously, as online's got busier, it's got to a position where, and I'm sure, sure you're the same yourself, you've had to actually step down some PT to make yeah. way for that extra workload. Yeah, yeah. You know, there, there was certainly a period where I was almost just kind of trying to do two full-time jobs. And obviously, mm. as you know, you're just going to burn out. Yeah, of course. Um, but I, th- I think this period, more than anything, has actually instilled that I-, I don't think I would want to give up the one-to-one side of things because I do like the gym floor. Yeah. But I think uh, ultimately, you know, the, the majority of the business in terms of how you can potentially scale things is, is always going to be online. Definitely. I feel like as well with me sort of being, I don't know, maybe young and just getting into it, I can start building habits now where my skill set is more based online. So for me, I've been PT, I've sort of been in the industry since I got into it around 18, um, but I've been studying since around 16, 17. But I think now, just in terms of skill set, what I can do, like you said, it's just easier to progress in the world of online. And I feel that it's easier, but I can deliver a better service online. It's so easy to create services, create funnels, learn advertising. So I think for me, Although I am a full-time PT like yourself, transition online will definitely be the go-to after this. Mm, yeah, I mean, I mean, you said it yourself. We're we're kind of in a position nowadays where you're so able to put our content through various different platforms on a, on an online basis. And you, in terms of how much you can actually scale your service, you know, the the the, the levels of kind of social platforms are just unlimited you know you've got obviously youtube podcast yeah. instagram facebook you know and obviously from from a sort of scale of perspective the amount of people you can reach and actually help and put content out to you're always going to be able to reach more with, with the online side of things so i certainly feel yeah. like that is definitely favored these days yeah 100 percent. especially even with the current situation like we've pretty much got all the time in the world to of course get our check-ins done our usual routine but that will never be a full day's work you know we've still got a large portion of the day and we can literally just continue leveling up our business the amount of stuff i've introduced to the service now in terms of welcome packs new ways of checking investing in the software it's, it's been ridiculous for scaling a business right now um and it's something i've seen a couple of people do as well so it's good to see others growing 100 percent, mate 100 percent. it's definitely been a period where you know, people have actually utilised to grow and, and put time into other endeavours that they haven't necessarily had the time for before. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know about yourself, but certainly with the, the demanding sort of one-to-one online schedule, the one area that sometimes I feel like I personally have lacked previously is actually developing the business and actually yeah. trying to work on what you can do within that business as opposed to always working in the business, if that makes sense. So this yeah. has definitely been a good period and it's I think if, for me personally, it's opened up my eyes that I need to be putting a lot more time into actually developing as opposed to working in the business, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. I think as well, a lot of that comes from what you stand for, you know, your actual business plan. You know, I, I initially had the brand and I found that going into lockdown, I've sort of had days where I've just sat down, readdressed completely what the brand stands for, what I stand for and where I initially want to go. So coming out of this situation, I have so much clarity and so much 
task on what needs to be done whereas beforehand I felt like like you said we was running two full-time jobs and I never really had that chance to sit down and think about where I was who I was and where I wanted to be now we have that time to develop that clarity which is only going to level us up as coaches further 100% and 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 what you just described there about kind of being sort of so involved in your work you don't have mm. the time to step away yeah that can that can just continue yeah, <laughs> that can keep yeah. going month after month into years and, and you can just keep in this rat race of kind of continually churning out churning out yeah um and then not actually realizing that you've actually not took a period to step away and analyze what you're doing from a, from a business perspective yeah definitely you know? and i think as an online coach it, it can sometimes be difficult because you are your own business you know in another bigger corporate business you'd have different people managing different aspects mm. whereas as a, as a coach as a pt you have to be the worker you have to be the employees you have to be your accountant your business marketer yeah, there's so many different aspects to it and know? then on top of that i found you know big cues for success is real reversal so on top of all the features you just said often i'll play myself as a client as well just to make sure that i'm really turning out the right types of content i'm giving out the right service and all of that comes from if i was the client would i like that so it definitely is a stressful job 100 percent yeah, yeah, 100%. It yeah. is. So, Everyone wants to be an online coach. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, obviously, going into home training, how have you, as an individual, as an athlete, handled that transition from gyms to home training? Obviously, I can see through your social media that you've, you know, you've invested a lot of kit. Do you feel like there's been a big change in terms of you know how you create load, how you generally structure your sessions? Um, so, are we talking about my individual training or yeah, your, training? your individual training, like you, was a, you, know, you as an athlete. Yeah, um, so I was very fortunate that, I say fortunate, I, I, I worked really hard to try and get some equipment, but I was very fortunate that about a week before the gyms closed, um, I sort of got here that that was going to happen and was very proactive in trying to get some kit together. Um, I had some very good friends lend me some equipment, so I had... I actually borrowed stuff off, I think, three different people. Mm. You know, a few plates of one person, a barbell and plates, a squat rack. So I was, from the off, I had enough kit to do your basics, you know. Yeah, of course. Bent rows, sort of back to old school. Mm. But I very soon found that it was very difficult to continually train that way how I wanted to in terms of recovery. Um, so, yeah, I've just invested in some kit. I've got a leg press. Um, I've got an adductor machine. For me, I knew that... I was going to be limited, A, in the space that I've got to obviously fit kit, because um, the wife won't let me put kit in the house. <laughs> <laughs> um, and B, obviously from a financial perspective, you need to kind of weigh up what's going to be worthy getting in the time frame that we've actually got. Because we're, yeah. we're back in the gyms in a couple of months, you don't need to be spending four or five grand, you know what I mean? Yeah, cool. So I had, I had to like prioritise the bits of kit that I knew I needed this year, and for me it's legs, so it's a no-brainer. But mm. yeah, in terms of programming and load and volume and things like that, bud, um, it's been a mixture of obviously the, the, the heavy loading yeah. and just increasing progressive overload, and then obviously more metabolic work that I probably wouldn't have had as much of before, yeah, yeah. but now because we to kind of reap the most out of what we've got, I have kind of lent towards more of that kind of stuff as well. Yeah, 100%. I've been similar, obviously, just in terms of the fact that I don't have as much machines. And obviously, you being a lot bigger than me, how you create heavy load to you is obviously a different kind of load to me. So I'm still able to create, you know, those heavier sets. But I think I sort of joined the vast majority of other people when training is generally taken a big increase in terms of volume. So, you know, I'm doing sets mm -hmm. now of, you know, again, just focusing on a lot more metabolic work, using techniques. We've got BFR training, the bands as well. So all it's been for me is just increasing training volume but i found so much so now that benefiting from a cv's perspective you know beforehand i do sort of like the odd widow maker in sets but my training is at pretty much revolving around sort of like that 12 rep range upwards now which is it's going to be a, it's going to be a skill that's transferable going out of lockdown that's for sure oh 100 percent 100 percent, and that's something that i said to a lot of clients and things like that you know we're, we're definitely having to, to lean more towards a lot of metabolic work and mm. things like that and if your cardiovascular system, you know, gives way before you're actually getting to that point of failure, yeah. getting to that point of creating a new stress, you know, you're not, you're gonna, you're gonna kind of find that you're, you're gonna limit your ability to progress. So, you know, it's definitely something that if you can instill that now, definitely. when you actually get back into an environment where we have the luxury of just increasing load, another plate, another plate. You know that's going to carry us forward to tenfold when we're back into exactly. that gym environment. So. so all we're doing there, people that are listening, is we're literally just always looking to be adaptive. So if you think what we've just addressed so far, we've came into lockdown, we've you know we've had a hurdle, so we've adapted to that hurdle. 
we've invested in kit, we've looked at different drivers of Hype Trophy and as a result we've now adapted. Again going out of gyms now, we've reintroduced new drivers of Hype Trophy, you know, new metabolic, new ne metabolic work, sorry. And then from there it's just always being adaptive. So for those that are struggling to make progress during lockdown, just always look to improve in one way or another, you know, make sure that you're increasing by rep, reducing the tempo, learning a new movement and then from there, as we are always adaptive, we are always in a position to change. 100% man. Yeah. Um, 100% so, <laughs> Yeah. So in terms of kit, do you think, obviously, as we are almost in the back end of it, do you think you'll be investing in any more kit or just keeping it as you are? Yeah, I'm going to keep things as it, as it is, mate, to be honest with you, just purely for the fact that we are getting wind of potentially the beginning of July. Yeah. Uh, I, think if, I think if we were still not even knowing where the light at the end of the tunnel was, I would potentially get a set of cables. Mm. Um but with, with it being maybe four or five weeks and we're back in that environment, I'm just going to carry on as we are. I'm quite enjoying the different stimulus anyway, you know, with certain movements. Yeah, I've mentioned on previous podcasts now, I definitely do feel like I've hit that sweet spot in terms of, you know, optimal programming now. You know, I've found movements yeah. that work for me and I've really readapted to the situation. So everything's good. We're still running a pull push legs, but, you know, how we structure the sessions, the actual exercise rotation is different, but I've adapted and for now I can keep progressing it. So like I said, I'm with you on that. I'll just keep running things as they are yeah i mean how how you finding the metabolic work in terms of recovery and, and and kind of muscle soreness and things like that um so i'm just coming up to sort of like the first two weeks on this almost new split and i must admit the first week i was absolutely broken especially the lower <laughs> uh, because we've got stuff like hip thrusters worked in but that higher rep work on hip thrust the glute doms can be absolutely excruciating sometimes but Great. that's when is it Exactly, yeah. But, you know, investing into recovery tools, you know, I've got the theory gun, I've, I've got, you know, I do my training, but I've got all the hours in the day to do recovery work and mobility work. So although it's been painful and I've readapted just by paying more attention to, you know, stretching, form rolling, theory gun work, it's not as bad as it could be. Oh, mate, the theory gun's the best investment I've ever made. Yeah, 100%. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, Excellent. Yeah. But obviously, how did you sort on you know obviously answering that question? How did you find that readapting to training? Did you find or sort of like any injuries, any doms, any soreness, anything like that? Um, yeah, I, I definitely noticed an increase in muscle soreness. But I think, in the same token, as you've just delved into as well, because we're in a, a spot where we can purely focus on recovery, mm. um, I've actually found that recovery has been better, and I've been able to train at an even higher intensity. Yeah, uh, yeah. train intensity has been very high, and um, the like I said, because just being able to hone in on every aspect of recovery, that being, you know, circadian rhythm, sleep hygiene, sort of day-to-day -day fascia release work, nutritional time and hydration, I've just found that recovery's been in a pretty good spot. I, I think the main thing for me has been my joints. Yeah. Uh, and that will simply be down to the fact that we've kind of lost that luxury to lock into a machine um, and everything's now having to be stabilised. Mm. So I, I, I do think that the main thing for me has definitely been I've had a few niggles in the joints and had to take a few little two-day deloads and things like that. Yeah. But like I say, again, we've got you know that time available now to start focusing on measuring other variables for example i'm with you on sleep as well sleep's been a big thing for me although i wake a little bit later you know going to sleep at that same time is still being very regimented and i've definitely put a lot of effort into tracking sleep where sleep at and making sure that it's a big part of my day that is always ticked off well 100 percent, mate and, and it's funny you say that regarding sleep actually because i think for the first maybe two or three weeks of the lockdown i was i normally get up at 5 30 before i go you know off to my pt mm. and i was kind of telling myself I had to get up at 5 for a day, yeah, I had to be course, productive. Yeah. And then I thought, well, actually, why not try utilise this period? I know I don't normally get enough sleep. Let's try to get an extra hour of sleep. Let's mm. try to get up at 6 for eight. And actually having that extra sleep and having that kind of more relaxed approach in the evening to kind of nail your mm. evening window has helped massively with recovery. So, it's, mm. again, it's about that whole adapting to the circumstances situation. Mm. So going into sort of like life in general and overall before fitness, what was, you know, that switch going into fitness and what was you doing before being a PT? Um, so I, I sort of did it between a lot of different jobs, but ma mainly I was a chef. Okay. Um, so before I actually went to catering school, I actually, uh, right, I mean, right back to school, I actually done cooking in school, and I was yeah. the only mate in our class. I think there's me and another lad. <laughs> I think I think I see I think I, I see think your mindset though. I think I see why you did that if you was in school. Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Um, and I think he was a put there out, out, not out of choice anyway. So, but I just I just wanted to be a chef, so I went to catering school. Um, so chef for about four years. 
uh, and then ultimately it just ended up not being the, the right career path for, for myself. Um, I, I enjoyed it, but I wasn't passionate enough about it for it to be my whole entire life, if that makes sense. And I think as a chef, you do very much have to devote your, your life to it if you want to get to top level. Um, so I dropped out of that, done a little bit of traveling, and I, I was always very interested in, in training. I was always kind of differing between wanting to do it and, and, and not having the, the, you know, the input, the, the desire. Um, and I think one day I just started training. I was about 19. I was a late bloomer, very late bloomer. Mm. Uh, started training. I was actually chefing. And I was doing a little bit of training on my split shift, sort of in that little two-hour period, yeah. training. Um, one of the um, pot washers, I was just going around his house, Polish geezer called David, and I'd go train <laughs> and, and train a little bit with him. And he'd show me how to train the old school way. And I just really got a love for it, mate, to be honest, and mm-hmm. just got obsessed with, um, with with how it made me feel, you know, from a, a mental perspective more than anything. Yeah. Um, and, and then it just, as they say, that, that was it. It went from there, you know. I just kind of got more and more involved and obsessed with it as I went along. Definitely. I was similar as well. Obviously, before this, I initially sort of came out of school and went straight into art college. So academically, I was never the maths guy. I was good at English. I was always more creative sort of thing. So I thought I was just going to you know, go into art. But I always wanted something more fulfilling. I always knew that that wasn't me. And similar to you, I wasn't so much into training, but I was always more so I wanted to work on myself. I always wanted to be better than what I am today. And that's still, you know, that's still instilled today. But from that, obviously, I joined the gym. I think I was... 16 i like i was jumping into those gym doors but from there it was literally just researching as much gym videos as i can you know watching a million and one athlete next videos back then but from yeah. there it just sparked you know showing your mate something in the gym to almost you know scaling a full, full-time pt business so that big transition it all starts with small beginnings Oh, 100%. Yeah, 100%. It, it's the same as myself. There was always an inkling. There was always a want there. Mm. You know, I remember sort of reading the muscle and fitness magazines when I was a teenager and sort of trying to replicate the workouts in my bedroom yeah. and things like that. <laughs> uh, there was always the want to join a gym. Uh, I think a lot of it might have even been a self-confidence thing as well, to be honest with you, but because yeah, I was a very 100%. small lad. Yeah. <laughs> I was one of the smallest yeah. guys in our here at school yeah. um, and, and you know people let you know about it when you're small as well so yeah they definitely I, do. I it was a self-confidence thing you know I need to put a little bit of size before I go into a gym which when I look at it now is ridiculous mm. uh, you know because everyone's in there for the same reason everyone's trying to improve how they look and feel self-development yeah um, but yeah I think finally getting that you know push to actually join a gym and it was I think it was the best thing yeah. best thing I've ever done 100% I think that quality there of obviously you know coming from sort of like skinny kids or even you know if you're listening you've came from a larger sort of like profile that idea of always wanting to be more and having that control to do more I think it almost leads you to think that bodybuilding was meant to be for you sort of thing like for me bodybuilding was always meant to be because I'm always going to want more so what's more than you know when you go from skinny guy to athletic guy and then from there mm-hmm. what's next it's, it's always going to be bodybuilding like if, as soon as I stepped in the gym I was meant to be a bodybuilder sort of thing I think that strive of always wanting more, it almost leads you to think that we was almost meant to do it in some ways. Yeah, 100%. That, uh, and you can't reach a ceiling with it. You yeah, know? It's definitely. not like you can't complete it. That's what I mean. You, you always continually develop. And, and, and it, it's very much matching your needs of wanting to always progress because you've now got something that you can always progress with and you can you can put your energy and focus into it so yeah i completely agree with you mate 100%. Definitely. so going into bodybuilding now obviously you've competed as men's physique um that transition how do you sort of like what's caused that transition from men's physique to going into classic now i mean to be honest with you mate i always preferred the bodybuilding style mm. the the body poses you know i was never reading the, the men's um Muscle and fitness magazines and, and iron up the physique guys. Yeah. And to be honest, the physique was even around then, but I was always obsessed with like the vacuum and the most yeah, muscular. Course, yeah. I just think, again, it just comes back to that self confidence thing, mate. I never thought I had it. I even remember saying, like, oh, I can never be a bodybuilder because, you know, I've not got great genetics, which is ridiculous to yeah, think of that course, now yeah. because, as we know, you just overcome your genetics, you work harder, you mm-hmm. know. But yeah, I think I always wanted to be a bodybuilder and it wasn't until. I was maybe mid this off season um, and started to see some development come through and I got, obviously got the confidence, the, 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 the call of confidence from my coach who said, yeah, I think you could do classic, that I realised actually, you know, you can do whatever you want, like, yeah. you can do open if you want. Exactly. So, 
Yeah. I think I think the desire to do classic was always there, mate. It was just a confidence thing. One hundred percent. How many sort of like an insight into your you know competing as a men's physique? How many sort of shows have you done? How did prep score on the men's physique side? Um, so I, my last men's physique competition was the UK BFF British Finals 2017, okay. and that was my seventh show. Um, I'd done seven shows in quite short succession, sort of like 18 months to two years. You know, I, oh, okay. I, I remember my first prep, I was pretty much back to back without mm. really having a sustained period of time off. Um, so yeah, I think, I think it was roughly seven competitions. Yeah, yeah. That's good. So obviously in terms of obviously a men's physique prep, I mean, I'm still yet to do my first show as I'm only young, but a men's physique prep, and although you haven't done your prep for classic, do you think that there'll be sort of any key differences between the preps, you know, in terms of running peak weeks or how you structure training, how you taper stuff? Do you think there'll be a key difference? Um, I, I think there will be a difference. Um, and I'll just because of the, I'm with a different coach now, and I yeah. think the coaching approach is, is already very difficult, already very different in a gaming mm-hmm. phase. So I predict that there'll be a lot more detail, a lot more. Or, I remember the last time I was in an off season or prepping, there wasn't really a huge focus on sort of managing stress, managing sleep, mm-hmm. um, and all these other biomarkers that you know I know you delve into as well. So I do think there'll be a, a lot more attention to detail, and ultimately, hopefully, you know, I'm confident that's going to bring a better package. And then obviously a big difference, meaning condition, I'm going to need to get a lot harder, drier and tighter for, for classic um, than physique. Even though the physique guys are, are very, very, very detailed these days, yeah. um, I just know we're going to have to go that extra mile with regards to condition to what I've yeah. achieved before. So. Yeah, I mean, it will be much more detailed um, and I'm sure the end products will take a, a lot more digging to get to. Yeah, 100% and although it will take a lot more digging, I'm sure with that extra accountability and focusing heavily on variables such as sleep, you know, your training, expenditure, stuff like that, it will make that prep a lot more easier and i found that the guys that always have coaches and obviously, is it Callum's your coach, am I right? Yes. Yeah, so Callum. you have him one of the top coaches in the country having that accountability is literally just going to make that prep so much more easier than opposed to doing it solo as well. Yeah, 100%. 100, and that's that's one thing that I would project to anyone. You know, mm. having a coach for that accountability is is, is uh, a no-brainer. Mm, definitely. I mean, it's definitely something I'd look into as well for sort of like shows that I do in the future. But I think similar to you, I would like just to cover that first show on my own, just from, it'd be mainly from a business perspective and a, you know, just an individual perspective. I think there's a lot of take comes I can learn, a lot of mistakes I can make, just to make sure that I can learn the best that I can learn from it. And then from there, we would make that invest into a coach. 100%, 100%. And I mean, as a learning tool as well, more than anything, sort of working with someone who's, you know, been there before, been yeah, in the yeah. trenches, so to speak, has, has dealt and managed multiple clients doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. You're just going to learn. It's going to be one of your best tools in your arsenal to, to uh, you know, continually develop your own skill set as a coach. Yeah. So obviously, in terms of you know the preps that you've done, was there any sort of you know key hurdles that you faced, and how did you overcome them, and how are you going to overcome them going into you know this next prep sort of thing? Um, in terms of in terms of hurdles themselves, I would say the main one, to be honest with you, but because. I've always been very fortunate to have a pretty solid environment, which I would say is one of the main things. Mm. Um, but I think it, the main hurdle that I probably face would be self-doubt in not necessarily knowing if I'm doing the right thing. And, mm. and I say that because the first four shows I've done, I actually just coached myself. Mm. Um, you know, I didn't think I didn't think I needed a coach. I guess I was, you know, inexperienced in that respect. But the main hurdles I had was not knowing if I was doing the right thing so instead of being able to have someone overlook everything and say you know this is what you need to do just Mm -hmm. execute it I was continually sort of looking online trying to find little pieces of information and and get a bit of info from here and here and piece together what I should be doing in regards to peak week trying to find a magic formula I remember I remember spending hours searching the internet trying to find like the the magic formula when it comes to carb load depleting sodium and things like that trying to find that extra 1% when in actual fact I just needed to focus on the fundamentals so for me I think I carried a lot of unnecessary stress with my first kind of three or four shows purely due due to the fact that I didn't have that third eye overlooking everything and obviously to combat that with just 
you've got a coach you know, yeah. it's the one thing I'd recommend to anyone yeah that's the that point you say I often see that across a lot of um, sort of like self coaching people as well me and Cam mentioned it on the previous podcast as well often when it comes to coaching yourself all it happens going up to that you know that peak week protocol is just you need to suffer more and the idea that suffer more correlates with more progress or taking more pounds off and often that's far from the case just because you know you feel that you always have to do more steps uh you know run carbs down even further deplete water even more and there's so much stuff that you know people often suffer when you'll find now working with column that you probably don't suffer as much as you thought that you needed to and you'll achieve a better outcome yeah, and if it does get to that point, it's okay. Four day deload. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, because your, your body's only going to be able to take so much. Yeah, hundred percent. And just to give you like an example as well, and you'll laugh at this, Josh, but I think in my first competition, I actually dehydrated for for forty eight hours. Wow. Um, yeah, whilst carb loading, which is, is above everything dangerous. Yeah. But um, and I remember having a glass of wine two nights before, one night before, and on the morning of. Um, I couldn't get pumped on stage and I wondered why <laughs> and that's because I've read it somewhere which is crazy yeah. you know yeah. but um, 100% mate you know just, just having that uh, having that coach to overlook everything for you is absolutely paramount not just in a, in a dieting phase but you know in a, in a, in a growing phase as yeah. well you're going to get more out of what you're doing if you've got someone to overlook everything for you definitely and as well you know as, obviously as, as comical as that event was it's something that you've now learned from you know a lot of the stuff I've done as a coach you know there's all sorts of stuff I've believed as a as a coach, you know. I think at one point when I was all like 16, 17, I even believed that carbs were bad for you. But now from from those comical stages and those mistakes that you do make, you're just able to learn yeah. from it now. So it, it you know it all is a learning process in the end really. Hundred percent. Hundred yeah. percent. So obviously going sort of out of lockdown, what are your plans trading wise, business wise? Like what do you think will change? Obviously you've got everything in lockdown now. Do you think it's just gonna be a case of continuing what you're doing or do you think going back into PT there'll be another big shift in what you're doing currently? I mean, I think it's at the moment it's still very much unknown. Mm. Um I've I've I'm still in frequent contact with a lot of my, well, with all my PT clients and a lot of them are still working with me online. Um, once the gym's open, we'll have to assess what the situation is because A, there might still be restrictive guidelines course, and we yeah. don't know what that's going to have with PT. Um, B, people might still be scared, you know, to go into the gym and train in that environment and, mm. and ultimately there might be a drop off because because people, you know, may not be in the best financial position. So I think with regards to one-to-one, mate, it's going to be a case of just assessing the situation. I'd, I'd love just to be able to step straight back into my normal routine of yeah, yeah. um, a 50-50 split, but I think we just had to assess that from a, from a business perspective. Yeah, and then when think... it comes to online, just continually trying to push the brand. You know, I've, I've just started my YouTube, which is something I've wanted to do for a long time. Mm. Um, I'm enjoying putting time and effort into that, enjoying sort of growing that separate social platform. So the, the plan will be to continually push that. Um, and then when it comes to training, just just more of the same, bud. But I'm looking yeah. forward to getting on a Smith machine, let me tell you. Yeah, I'd, I'm definitely looking forward to burying myself in a pendulum squat, that's for sure. But definitely, obviously, yeah. business business wise you know um as I was obviously as i've used this time to assess sort of like who i am what i stand for it's just given me the skill set now to you know i've got the systems in place for me i've been working on a lot of strategies that i can almost like automate strategies you know um i'm working on a website now that's going to allow clients to sort of have their own member sections which they can just check in see what they're doing and then from there it, it just allows it to be a bit more automated so i can start focusing on different elements so little skill sets like that i think i'm only just going to capitalize more going into back into normal gym so hopefully by the end of the year i'd like to see myself coaching full-time online mm, yeah that's a good target mate yeah. uh, i think just to kind of second on what you just said you know with sort of trying to improve your skill set in this period and, and carry that forward mm. i think that's certainly something which is i've seen a lot of people do um actually use this period as a positive and think right yeah. what what is what is it that i've wanted to develop what mm. is it that i've wanted to invest some time into but I haven't been able to because i've been so involved in the business um and actually using this period to do just that and then continuing that trend when normality normality yeah, starts yeah. to resume I yeah. think that's I think that's brilliant. Yeah. You know, and I think that's something that a lot of people should take note of, you know, certainly utilising this time because we're not we're not gonna get this kind of situation back. Definitely. And when normality return, returns and everyone's back to the, the rat race, mm. they might look back and think, you know what, I really wish that I, I used that time to do X and Y. 
exactly it's, it's the stuff that we do now that determine who we are in five years and I, I, I essentially live by that every day um, and even obviously it, it's just it can be something as little as investing in a member site or reading a book for example a large portion of my day today is literally investing in your coach's member site the amount of hours I put into that site over over this period of time and it's just literally just improving knowledge and when you improve knowledge you share that with more people it opens up more opportunities so just little stuff will always equal big actions 100% and, and, you, and your clients will notice that as well they'll okay. notice that you're putting the additional time into helping them essentially mm. and that's that's only going to get positive rapport and positive feedback exactly a lot of people have as well and it's good to sort of be commended now for the work that you're doing and the only thing that I'm more than ready for it is just to continue that in a more linear fashion so I'm ready yeah. for it really yeah so I mean that essentially wraps up everything I wanted to cover so is there anything that you sort of want to add on to the end of that podcast you've got any plans coming up anything you want to announce um I mean, with regards to, to, to plans, I mean, obviously the, the main standout one is going to be the, the classic bodybuilding debut, which is mm. next year. Okay. Um, we haven't got the dates yet, but yeah. it's certainly going to be next year. Yeah. So that's something that I'm very much looking forward to. That's all going to be documented and vlogged on the YouTube channel. Mm. Um, and, and for me, like I said, you know, from a business perspective, um, you know, just continually to, continuing to, to push to, to grow the online brand and, and help as many people as possible, you know, whatever endeavor that may be, whether it be body compositional, whether it be competitive, um, or just, you know, general fat loss. Yeah, I would definitely say I watched your most recent video. If you can capitalize on consistency with the same quality throughout those videos, I'm definitely onto a winner that like, I see some big potential for that channel. Um, so I definitely look forward to following that classic journey because the quality in terms of content production, it's all going to match the physique that you can display. And if you've got viewers that can follow your journey, I imagine from a business perspective, you'll just absolutely scale off the planet. Oh, thanks, man. I appreciate the feedback. Yeah, I've had a few good positive feedback from that video. So hopefully just continue to uh, keep delivering the content. And um, like I said, like when I first started YouTube, I'm not trying to overtake the world with it. It's just nice to have another platform where you can, exactly. you know, put content out and, and not be rushed. You know, Instagram story, yeah. you've got 14 seconds in it. Yeah, of course. I just yeah. need a platform where I can just actually take time, you know, put some decent content out. So, yeah, I appreciate the feedback, mate. Yeah. But, I mean, obviously, I do a lot of, as well as coaching business, I do a lot of work into the nitty-gritties of social media and this almost like the psychology of people. So, as you're on YouTube now, as you're on this podcast, you're building habits, you're being present across different social media so that when our audience are opening up their phones, when our, you know, our clients are scrolling through their phones, all they're seeing is me, all they're seeing is you. They open YouTube, Karen Colbert is there, Josh Clark is there. So, as we're building habits now, our informative content is all they're being exposed to. So it's only helping them achieve their goals. When it comes to bru- uh, so building a business, all, all they're going to see is us. So as we're building habits, we're building a business. So definitely yeah. you know, capitalise on YouTube and even even get your own podcast as well. Just be present across everything. Yeah, to be honest with you, mate, that's something that I have had um, a, a, a thought of doing for, for a while. Mm. Um, and again, just like anything, I think it just comes down to that time management thing. Yeah, um, so I think the plan certainly is just to continue to invest time into into the YouTube and then potentially push onto a podcast in, in the near future. But yeah. yeah, 100%. Yeah. So that essentially wraps up today's podcast. So big thanks for coming on. I'll link all your details below so people can check out your account, follow your journey and stuff like that. But that wraps up today's episode, guys, and I will see you guys for the next episode soon.